Conservation Ag Update is brought to you by Cultivase. Hello and welcome to Conservation Ag Update. I'm Noah Newman. So if harvest season was like a football game, we'd be kicking off the third quarter right now. 45% of corn and 62% of soybeans are harvested according to the latest USDA Crop Progress Report. Fun fact, that soybean number is actually 10% ahead of the five-year average. Let's check in with Lauren Steinlock, No-Till Farmers 2023 Conservation Ag Operator Fellow. The West Union, Iowa no-tiller was 50% done with corn after the first week of October. He says corn yields are looking pretty good despite only getting 10 inches of moisture since planting. Now the jury's still out on soybeans, but with all that's happened this year, Steinlock, he says it's going to be an interesting educational fall. Ever since we started with the cover crops and that, uh, you never seen this much change in the soil types. I mean, even this hilltop right behind us here, that is a gravel knoll. There's actually going to be beans this year. There, we're on a normal dry event. That area would have been burned up. And that, uh, and like I said, you know, the neighbors the last couple of days have been around on 8-9% beans. Our beans just ain't dying. So the soil health pay, I don't know, I guess we'll see when we harvest, but uh, you know, I'm a little shocked about the variability this year. That's something, you know, the covers and stuff like that, and no-till and all that's helped us even out the yield maps. But th this year, you know, is it the extreme showing up or what is it? I don't know, you know, what, I, what I'm wondering is, do we have like tile line overloads and that showing up where we got extra moisture in them areas or what? Be a lot to sift through and try to analyze and figure out what actually happened out here. Looking forward to that analysis. 53% of corn, meanwhile, is in good to excellent condition, same as last year. 52% of soybeans are in good to excellent condition as well. That's down 4% from last year. Switching gears now to a prediction that really grabbed our attention. Strip till could become the predominant tillage system in Minnesota by 2026. That is what Minnesota Agricultural Resource Center Executive Director Warren Formo believes, and he explains why in an article by Frank Lesseter on striptillfarmer.com. Check it out. But this begs the question, what will it take to drastically increase no-till and strip-till adoption rates? Dr. Ben West, Executive Director of Farmers for Soil Health, shares two big keys. You know, we think uh, a really big key to enhance adoption of cover crop, strip, strip crop, no-till, is technical assistance. I mean, if you talk to farmers that have used it for a while, they'll all tell you two things. One, that it provides them great benefit on their farm. And two, it took them a while to figure it out. Uh, you know, farming is complex and adding a new tool, a new technique in the mix sometimes can take farmers some time to figure out. And being there to help them figure out, you know, what the science says and how it can help them better implement it on their, on their farms is really key. And then financial incentives, right? Putting real money on the table to help farmers mitigate the risk and sustain the, uh, the willpower and effort to continually adopt these practices in the future. Yeah, Wes says a lot more companies are actually setting sustainability goals and putting money in the game to help farmers adopt these conservation practices. All right, let's send it over to McCain Vogel now for today's Cover Crop Connection. McCain, take it away. Thanks, Noah. McCain Vogel here for this week's Cover Crop Connection. Gary Zimmer, a grower in Spring Green, Wisconsin, who some refer to as the father of biological farming, hosted a field day on his farm over the summer and explained why soil fertility has to involve the exchange of nutrients in a carbon biological cycle. According to Zimmer, too many farmers simply lay fertilizer on top of their land and fail to connect the nutrients to a carbon source. Here's Gary talking about his unique approach to cover crops and how they can help with soil fertility on his farm. We used to do a blend, a four-way blend. I had uh, red clover, white clover, crimson clover, and alfalfa. The crimson clover never did really well. Red clover dominates. And now this year we took the alfalfa out because that didn't compete very well. We put sweet clover in. Now the sweet clover is the problem. I want a big tap root. I want a rhizome root. So I got different root systems. So I said, I said three different clovers because they got different rooting systems. And the sweet clover really, really took off. And I'm a little nervous about that baby, because that, but that's gonna have a big taproot system because we, we do run shallow incorporating residues, but if it's a wet, muddy year, we also got inline rippers. We got a ripper that just cuts slats in the ground and picks the soil back up if we compact it. Now we try to stay everything on uh, 12 row equipment. So everything is all wheel track, or all 30 feet wide with everything except the combines are not. And so, but, and the tillage tools when we get done with this and the, this will just be, this will now after its combine, 
We'll just leave it until about the end of, of August, and then it'll get flail mowed down. Everything stays. And then another crop will grow. Now, some years we didn't flail mow it. We just let it grow, and the clover got this big, and then it killed itself. So now we flail mow it. Then we, so we get the clover that's here now, and some years it's going to be like this. Most years. This year, the moisture it's not. And so then we get that growth, plus the rye straw. And then we get the growth that takes place by the end of August. There'll be another crop this tall. And then come winter, it'll be this tall going into winter. And then next spring when it gets this tall, we'll take it down. So we don't plant mammoth red clover. We plant freedom and high expensive four cut red clovers. We want four cuttings out of that red clover in that one year. And then you can't do that with mammoth as a two cut system. And so we got freedom and other better genetics. If you want to hear more about Gary Zimmer's operation and some of his unique cover crop methods, be sure to check out the latest episode of the Cover Crop Strategies podcast at CoverCropStrategies.com. For this week's Cover Crop Connection, I'm McCain Vogel. Back to you, Noah. Thank you, McCain. McCain's also working on an article for the upcoming No-Till Farmer December issue that explores how autonomous technology can solve tangible problems on your farm. This past week, I got an up-close look at its potential to do just that. Wisconsin Agco dealer Vanderloop Equipment demoed the Sabanto Autonomy Kit on a Fint tractor for a customer who's potentially interested in buying the package for about 60000 bucks. The farmer runs a custom farming business and manages several no-till acres. So they use the kit here to autonomously mow an 80-acre field, and the customer jokingly mentioned to a coworker that the Autonomy Kit doesn't call in sick, doesn't show up hungover, and will work weekends without complaining. Product specialist Mark Vanderloop says Autonomy can definitely increase the efficiency of any operation operation if the operator buys into the new technology. I think it's just seeing is bleeding, right? At the end of the day, if you can come on and see it and you trust it, when you're done watching 20 acres being cut, you actually get bored. You kind of go, okay, now what do I do? Well, you go back to the farm, you go do other chores, you go, you go take phone calls, so on and so forth. Um, it's the understanding from, from concept to visualization to, to saleability. And Ultimately, there's been a lot of promises made in the, uh, the autonomous offerings. Very few have actually come to fruition. And, and Sabanto has actually brought that to fruition, and that's what we love being partners with them. Is, is was literally on the phone with an engineer this morning going, hey, how do we do this? What, what happens here? Um, and that's just a learning curve on my end. So they're, they're fast moving, they're an agile company. They're, they're willing to, to put their money where their mouth is. And check out the full ride-along interview with Mark on our Farm Innovations YouTube channel. Our video of the week takes us to a farm that won the 2023 Kentucky Wheat Yield Contest with 143 bushels per acre. The farmer is one of Phil Needham's clients. And in this video, the no-till innovator shares one of his top tips for no-tilling wheat and soybean stubble. The challenge is a lot of growers struggle to spread residue evenly with the combine. A lot of growers are putting 40, maybe 45 foot heads on the front of a combine, but their combines are only spreading 30 feet or 35 feet at the back, meaning they're not able to spread residue uniformly, and that's the important word, all the way across the width of the header. So the residue has got to be spread evenly. You can't tolerate bands of residue like what I'm showing here in the image. That's just not going to work for high yielding wheat. The reason is these heavy bands often result in hair pinning. They often result in shallow seeding depths where they raise, raise up the gauge wheels. You've sometimes got open seed slots if it's wet. And then you've got slow warming, especially in the spring. Needham also stresses the importance of using quality seed varieties and placing phosphorus in the row at seeding time. Video, photo, or story you'd like to see on the program, shoot me an email at innewman at lespub.com. That'll do it for this edition of Conservation Ag Update. Thanks for spending part of your busy day here with us. We'll see you next time.